this week there are three main subjects that we are focusing attention on. Number one, corruption. The NDC has come under a number of corruption allegations in a few months gone by. As some of these allegations deepen, the latest raised by Martin ABK Amidu, former Attorney General, will be asking whether or not the allegations uh, are biting enough, requiring the NDC to extricate itself from the tag. Or uh, has the president and his party become Teflon dons on who this tag of corruption will not stick? We'll find out. Later, we'll also talk about the appointment of a sole commissioner to deal with the judgment debt saga and a number of legal and other questions that are coming up following that appointment. Has that CI that set up this commission actually been laid before Parliament? Was a legal basis for proceeding with his investigation? We'll get into a conversation on that. Our second subject for discussion is the name Rawlings and the subject the 2012 elections. How much impact will the former president's maneuvers affect the fortunes of various parties in the 2012 elections. You do know that he's affirmed support for his wife. He's vouching for the NDP's credibility. And he's just had a meeting with the MPP's flag bearer, uh, Nanado Dankwa Akufuado. So how much impact will the former president's maneuvers affect various parties' fortunes in election 2012? Already, some say it won't amount uh, to much. Some say it could create some deepening fortunes for one party or the other. And finally, we'll talk about a new UN uh, expert panel report that says that uh, there's a military structure in Ghana that has been put up by some elements associated with the uh, pro-Bagbo regime that seeks to undermine the Ivorian regime. Now, as a country, we have given assurances that we will not allow our nation to be used as a launch pad. Yet the UN expert panel seems to think that there's something nefarious going on here. Question, are we playing ostrich with the subject of Ghana as a launch pad for instability in Ivory Coast? I have guests who will be helping us answer these questions, but I'll be excited to hear what you think as well. Let me remind you of our text numbers, 1422 across networks. You can put them on facebook.com slash join 997 or send us a tweet. I tweet at KO Nkrumah. Let me just remind you of the key subjects we are discussing this morning. Number one, corruption. And in recent months, a number of corruption allegations have been leveled against the ruling NDC. Uh, the latest set of questions to deal with corruption have come forward from Martin Amidu, former Attorney General in the NDC government. Uh, but the question we're asking this morning, are the allegations biting, therefore requiring the NDC to extricate itself from the tag? Or has the president, John Mahama, and his party become Teflon dons uh, to the extent that none of these allegations will stick on them? Let me hear your thoughts on that subject. And still talking of corruption, you know that the sole commissioner, Justice Apo, uh, has been sworn into office. Uh, a CI-79, which set up his commission, we're told, has been gazetted. There are a few questions about the legal basis on which he will proceed with his work. We'll examine what he can really do uh, and examine some of the legal questions that are coming up as well. Number two, we'll talk about the Rawlings factor and how it affects the 2012 elections. How much impact will the former president's recent maneuvers uh, have for the, or have on the fortunes of various parties in the 2012 elections. He's affirmed support for his wife. Uh, he's vouching for the NDP's credibility. He's just had a meeting with Nana Kufuado. Tell me what you think uh, of its impact on the 2012 elections. And uh, there's also a new UN expert panel report that says that there could be some persons uh, engaging in some nefarious activities here in Ghana against Ivory Coast. Are we playing ostrich? with the subject of Ghana as a launch pad for instability in Ivory Coast. I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. Let me introduce my guest to you. The Honorable, um, well, no, let me start from my right. Uh, Abdul Malik Kwekubako is the uh, managing editor of the New Crusading Guide newspaper. He's uh, joined us and he's already here uh, in the studio. Chief, good morning and good thank morning. you for joining us uh, on news file. Mr. Kwabna Sapon is a member of the MPP's communication team. He joins us as well in the studio. Chief, good morning and thank <coughs> you for uh, joining us. The Honorable uh, uh, Edua Sari is a member of parliament for Adenta. He's uh, also joining us uh, here on news file this morning. And Mr. Godwin Adagwini is, uh, is a lecturer at the University of Ghana. He's also joining us. He's also a lawyer as well. He's joining us uh, for our conversations. I want to start off by reading, for your benefit, a few parts of the statement put out by Mr. Martin Amidu. And uh, he spent some time talking about what he thinks is bugging the NDC when it comes to corruption. He has challenged President Mohammed's suggestion on how to deal with corruption. You recall that uh, the president in recent weeks, I think somewhere just around last week, mentioned uh, that you know, he was inviting any state agency 
to investigate him on any charges of corruption and uh, that he will be found clean. Well, Matt Namidu has been uh, responding to the president's claim. I just want to read you a few excerpts of uh, his comments. If you go to the uh, third paragraph, he says, My respectful view is that President Mahama should set up a bipartisan committee of parliament to take evidence from Ghanaians on the matter of corruption in his government. As Minister for the Interior and later as Attorney General, I continually took up the matter of corruption in government with the late President Mills and the Chief of Staff, John H.M. Newman. It was in 2010 that I told the late President and the Chief of Staff that if the late President could advise his appointees to reduce corruption, abuse of office and arrogance for the remaining two years, the NDC would win the 2012 elections hands down. I kept going back to this topic with the late president and the chief of staff until 13th January 2012 when I fell out with the president on the Woyome matter. I had the privilege of speaking very plainly to the late president because of our personal friendship of several years, uh, which he knew was the only reason I agreed to his pressure to come into his government. And then he goes on to cite two examples uh, which may be instructive for our conversation this morning. The very first example is, uh, I think, in the eighth paragraph of his statement. He says, it will be recalled that in July 2011, there was hue and cry about the prices of the acquisition of five aircraft for the Ghana Armed Forces. Even though on the 26th of July 2011, the late Professor Mills attempted to defend the purchase of the five aircraft, he became convinced of the necessity to set up a committee to investigate those purchases. A committee to investigate the process of the acquisition of five aircraft, including the Embraer 190 aircraft and hangar from the Ghana Armed Forces, consisting of Mr. William Abwa, Mr. George Amwa, and Brigadier General Alote Retired, former Judge Advocate General, was put together. Uh, Mr. Amidu goes on to say that he wrote the terms of reference as Attorney General for this committee, but he goes on to say pressure groups never allow the committee to take off. And here's an instructive part. But the very fact that the late President Mills even contemplated this committee meant that he was uncomfortable with and suspicious of the alleged inflated prices of the aircraft. Ms. Amidu goes on to raise a second example in his statement. He says uh, there was a meeting that was held at the office of the president to discuss and to sign an undertaking, literally absolving the EO group from any further prosecution, even though he, Attorney General, objected to this because he thought they had done something untoward. Uh, he says these are two examples of incidents where persons within and close to government were up to acts that he wasn't pleased with. And then I want to read a final part of his statement, uh, which may be instructive for our conversation. He says, I give only the foregoing two examples to show that corruption or the perception of corruption in this government is endemic and systemic and was not personal to my late friend Professor Mills. The people infecting this government with the endemic corruption and abuse of office for private gains are alive and in President Mohammed's government. As I mentioned, in times past, other persons have hurled uh, <coughs> corruption allegations at this government. But are these allegations biting enough, requiring the NDC perhaps to take a tougher stance <coughs> to extricate itself from it? Or perhaps, you know, these are things that fly above people's heads, and at the end of the day, uh, they do not stick. Perhaps I will start uh, with Abdul Malik uh, Kwekubako of the New Crusading Guide uh, on the subject of corruption. Are these allegations beginning to perhaps uh, uh, hang a huge weight on the government, needing it to uh, uh, defend itself, or perhaps they will just not stick? Well... It's not a matter of whether it will stick or not stick. It's a matter of whether government ought to respond to what Martin Amidu is saying or not. And I'm inclined to believe that silence is not the appropriate cure for allegations emanating from a former attorney general and a long-standing member of the ruling party. Uh, so. I've had opportunity to discuss this issue this week, and I was of the opinion that government, at least at this preliminary stage, ought to respond to some of the things Martin Amidu has put out there in the public domain. At this stage, I don't have any evidence to the effect that what he said really amounts to corruption. And as he said, he himself said either corruption or perception of corruption. Perception, clear, it's there. 
even the is it the Transparency International usually it's based on perceptions. Mm. So it means that one ought not to underestimate perception index. So to that extent, you see, he's given us two specific cases. One being the purchase of is it five aircraft. He goes further to talk about the fact that a committee was set up. He mentions names of people who were to constitute that committee. That is why I am saying that there ought to be a response. Did it happen or it didn't happen? Why didn't the committee work? Does the government have answers in terms of the purchase of the aircraft? Those documentations are available. They are public records within the armed forces, within the Ministry of Finance, and I'm sure even some aspects of it within Parliament. So you see, when you do this, when you handle such allegations, particularly because it's coming from somebody like Martin Amidou, former Attorney General, and I repeat, a long-standing member of the ruling party. It's not a serial caller. It's not just any serial commentator. It's not even a journalist. Even though if a journalist does that, you still ought to reply. So I'm saying that he's lifted the bar, and it requires, in the terms of accountability, transparency, good governance, to sometimes give responses to some of these things. It's even in their own interest. That's in the government's own basic interest to respond. So that fact that we haven't had any response, I'll be honest with you, I'm disappointed. There are some people who so treat him with contempt. It's just, uh, there are really people questioning his mi mindset or mental state today, and that's unfortunate. But I'm not sure that it's good for government, any government, and we're not talking of this particular government, to rest or sleep over such things. So that's my view, because I sit in here, I don't have much evidence to go by in terms of the aircraft purchase matter. But the other issue that he raised, which is the UO Group uh, shares. I happen to have done a lot of work on the UO Group aspect. And indeed, I also happen to know some of the things he's, he's talking about, especially, as he said, July 2, 2011. And I knew some of the things that were happening. Now, let me take my time and explain that thing carefully. In my candid opinion, the government as a corporate entity and whoever represented the government in the Attorney General's office, that is from Betty to Martin, who thought they had a case against the UO group, really were walking on the path of no case. They had no case, and I'll explain. And then come to where I think Martin's concern is. As far as I'm concerned, the government was pursuing a course of political vendetta against the UO group from day one because they perceived the UO group as a pro-NPP or surrogates of the Kufu administration. And began by, they proceeded on very false and faulty premises. And I was shocked in the initial stages, in the sense that they were even not aware that the UO group's share, that 3.5%, was part of the Cosmos 90%. And that the model petroleum agreement that had been there before Kufo's administration came into office was what had made it so that the investor who brings 100% investment takes 90% and Ghana takes 10%. If there's discovery, the uh, balances change based on carried and other pay, uh, paid interest and things. These things are basic. And there are thousands of such examples. So it was shocking to me that anybody could proceed on that. But you see, it was a political vendetta that was being waged. And that resulted in, if you recall, that outrageous 25 counts uh, uh, charge sheet, a copy of which I'm holding here. The one Betty Mould claimed had been hijacked or stolen from her office because we published it. And they were talking of financial loss to the state and all those things. Well, th those things were totally offbeat. And at the end of the day, since mid-2009, that they had been pursuing the Euro group with so many things and they kept, they kept on, the charges kept on falling apart, falling apart. I liken it to what happened in Kennedy, in Japan's case, where they began with treason and all the rest and came to dwarfish, uh, you know, uh, counts and things. Precisely. At the end of the day, everything they were seeking to do with this charge sheet collapsed and it came to forgery and false declaration to public agencies, very minimal, minor charges, which could not enable the state 
to even confiscate the shares of EO Group. Now, what was happening is that EO mm. Group too were entitled to be paying cash calls, you know, mm -hmm. and ca Cosmos was carrying them. They owed Cosmos a lot. It was getting to a stage that if they couldn't fulfill that, they would automatically lose their shares. But to any of the other partners, clearly, Talo decided to come in and buy them off. Now, there was a problem. And this is why I think Martins has a, a legitimate case. The problem was this. You, you, are, you are investigating you. You, are, you intend to prosecute them. And they also need, by law, they needed executive consent for Talo to buy their shares. So there was actually a dispute in government. And that's a fact. And I'm aware of some of those meetings that took place. And I'm aware of Martin's reluctance or resistance to the idea of providing the executive consent. I'm aware of all those things. Those things are facts. But at the end of the day, I think he was overruled by higher authority, which obviously must be the president. And in this case, that Minister of Energy then got the, uh, the authority to give that executive consent. When that happened, I had the opportunity of being interviewed by Radio Gold, other journalists who were also very uh, keen uh, uh, in the investigations of these matters also spoke on the same day. And I indicated that in my view, the very moment the executive consent was given, I thought the criminal prosecution option would be dead. It would be difficult to continue with that. So it did happen. And if you recall, government issued a statement there were arguments and crit criticisms against government from its own friendly uh, media and uh, con uh, allies to the extent that, look, the government was supposed to have given a certain undertaking. And uh, there was also supposed to have been some uh, undertaking from the EU side. Government denied those sides but insisted, I have a copy of the statement here, but I think it was on my journal line even, insisted that the executive consent that had been given did not mean an indemnity. Uh, thank you. Precisely. That's what government said. And then the matter quietly phased out. I thought the government had done the right thing relative to the EU matter. I thought the vendetta had been too protracted and was unnecessary and undesirable and destructive of Ghanaian business and uh, initiative. So I thought government had done the right thing. But I knew that Martin was not happy because in his view, as an attorney general, they had a case against you. Even and if those uh, 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 new charges were, you know, less weightier charges, they yes. still had a case. Yes, he, that's his view. Yeah. And you can grant him that mm -hmm. as attorney general. So in, t in terms of his principles, he refused to go along with the consent. The matter has been done. I ask, so what is the status of the criminal prosecution option today? How fruitful was the government statement that was issued when there was a storm about the executive consent. So you see, again, Martin has raised the case. That case must be responded to in the, in the name of good governance, transparency, and accountability. Government must have the courage to explain to Ghanaians that fine, we gave executive consent to Tal uh, Talu and UO uh, transaction. We indicated that the criminal prosecution option was still available. What is the state of it? In my candid opinion, if you ask me for my own view, from day one, it was a political vendetta that the government as a government was carrying out. And there was no way they were going to succeed <coughs> unless they just wanted to perpetrate mischief against Ghanaian business enterprise. Mm. So the silence of government, in your opinion, doesn't help. But it doesn't help anybody and doesn't help government. But I'm sure you're also very familiar with this uh, 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 idea in politics in that sometimes when you uh, respond to... Uh, uh, charges that you consider unfounded, you give it more air to burn. I tell you, when it's coming from a former attorney general, and I repeat, a long-standing member of the ruling party, and somebody well known for his crusade against corruption over the years, it's, it's like that. You may, you may, or may or may not like Martin Amido. Okay, you may have differences with him on certain issues, but he has a certain character profile which you can take away from him. Now, such a person, and he's. Was it not the most immediate, the immediate past attorney general? I was think he? He was. He was. Yes, yes. Yes. So you don't underestimate that. And I'm saying that when the international groups, Transparency International, when they are doing that estimates and ratings 
and the talking of perception index, some of these things fuel into it, inform those perceptions. So it is in the government's own interest. It is not a serial caller who is sitting somewhere and making all sorts of allegations. Okay? And there are times that even some of the allegations made by serious politicians look so useless eh, that you can decide to dismiss it and let the public judge it. But not this one. Mm. He's talking here of purchase of aircraft. He's talking of a committee that was set up. He's talking of inflated pricing. You government want to ignore that? You do that at your own peril. Mr. Dazari, why the silence? <laughs> Thank you, Kujo. Um, I think um, uh, this pressure from my big brother, Kuku, to get the NDC respond to... I mean the government. Oh, the, that's, uh, sorry, sorry. The government to respond to the allegations of Mr. Martin Amidu. Um, I seem to, in my personal opinion, uh, whatever is in this uh, epistle, one has to take their time to also digest the details a little bit. Um, first and foremost, if I have to quote portions of the statement, um, he says, the first paragraph somewhere, he says that uh, which Ghanaian in his right senses will report a certain precedent for such an investigation in a hope. This one is in reference to the uh, declaration of who by the president that um, he was challenging anybody who has evidence that he's corrupt to report him to any of the institutions set up for the purpose of or to investigate him. Um, and you hear or you read uh, Martin Amidu ask such a question that with Ghanaian in his right senses will report a certain precedent for such an investigation in the hope of getting impartial results. Well, there has been a precedent to this uh, or an issue regarding a certain precedent. In this, in this case, I'm talking about President Kufu, when I think uh, Honorable Bagbin uh, took up a case re uh, regarding his hotel issue or the Sans Hotel issue to trash. Is Martin Amidu saying that trash then? Uh, did an imp uh, a partial job. Is it, is it what Martin wants to tell us? That the institutions that we have set up to, or as a nation, we have set up to see to some of these issues. Is he, by this statement, indicting these institutions? And from some other um, portions of the statement, he also is calling for a parliamentary uh, committee, that the president should institute a parliamentary committee, you know, bipartisan committee to look into this matter. In one breath, he is damning the work of an institution set up to ensure that uh, cases of um, administrative justice and human rights are, you know, investigated and redress uh, found for whoever will go and seek them. So for me, I think that in all of this, Mr. Martin Amidu seemed to be uh, gaining some, I don't want to use the word notoriety, but for the want of a better word. Um, trying to pontificate some level of, uh, you know, moral, high mor moral high ground, or let me say high moral ground, that what he thinks should be done is what should be done. Nobody else has any uh, reason to do things differently. But the NDC, or even to come back to this parliamentary issue, parliament does not take instructions from the executive. That is for his information. If Parliament wants to set up an ad hoc 
committee or the, the, the constitution uh, grants that opportunity according to our standing orders that uh, Madam Speaker can at any given time set up an ad hoc committee apart from those that have already been institutionalized in the standing orders. Uh, we have standing committees and <coughs> other select committees. At any given time, Madam Speaker can set up an ad hoc committee to look into a particular issue. But that instruction does not emanate from the president. So in the first place, he got that aspect wrong. And so going on this matter, as a government, and for that matter, uh, a party, because he indicts the government or ministers and goes ahead to also mention NDC collaborators in this government. So he seemed to stand on one end, and I want to want, I'm wondering whether he's still a member of the NDC or, or not. He should let us know so that when we are addressing him, we will know how to uh, or where to focus our issues. Because I think that, yes, he may have legitimate, legitimate reasons uh, to raise uh, uh, the, the issues he has raised. But we are of the view also that if you belong to a party, this is not how to approach issues. We believe that certain cases, if you found them, yes, you were trying to get the attention of the late president, you didn't get it. What attempts has Mr. Martin Amidu made? What overtures has he made uh, towards the current president? He should let us know. Rather than choose this unorthodox means to, you know, hound, or if, if for want of a, word, a better word again, or brief down the necks of uh, the NDC and the government. For us, we think that Sar Grips is really blinding his, his otherwise objective uh, approach to issues. You understand? Because you realize that till today, we, we, any time he, he comes across with statements like these, you end up, or he ends up leaving gaping holes behind in terms of bitterness that, you know, whatever he, he tries to put out leaves on the minds of anybody in the NDC. You can read bitterness. Yes. You also find that he goes to, uh, the, the opposition pounces on the information. So who is this information directed to, if you want to ask? Is, is this something he's throwing out so that the opposition parties will pick them and deal with the NDC as he expects? Or it is a real problem that he thinks requires mm. some approach, you know, pragmatic approach. And if that is what he wants, or if the latter is what he wants, then I think this, the, the, the manner in which he goes about it is not appropriate. It will not be taken serious because, yes, I'm taking this position because I think, yes, there could be some substance in what he's putting out, but the, 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 the form, form. is what you have an issue with. Yes. Okay, so we've dealt with the form. Let's deal with the substance now. He raises specific instances, mentions names, gives specific examples, and goes on to suggest, for me, what is worrying, uh, that, uh, you know, the collaborators, in the words that you uh, use, the collaborators are still there and are within President Mohammed's uh, uh, government. There's a party heading for an election. There's a party that speaks a lot about probity, accountability, good governance. Let's talk about the substance of those issues. Uh, uh, should the party be dealing with the substance of the issues? Should the government, rather, be dealing with the substance of those issues or just be silent? Kojo, if you want to tie that in with the um, appointment of the sole um, commissioner, um, you find that, yes, President Mahama, when he addressed um, all of us, with the, when he put out his policies, he, one of the things or the key issues he raised was to set up a commission to manage or to handle this issue about uh, settlements and judgment. Settlement payments and judgment, yes. Exactly. So um, he, had, he had made an attempt also by appointing 
this uh, to Justice uh, Apple. Apple. So, if you also listen to or read this statement by Mr. Martin Amidu, most of the issues he raised here had to do with this judgment, debt, and settlement issues. Well, actually, the two examples he raised in this one have nothing to do with judgment, debt, and settlement debt. He talked about the five aircrafts, mm -hmm. and then he talked about the EO group. They are not judgment, debt Well, issues. for me, I don't know much about the EO group issue. But we all know that there's a challenge with this, uh, uh, what would I call it, uh, uh, the purchase of the aircraft and all of those. What's the challenge with it? Um, if he's talking about the Embra yes. and all of those things, yes. um, I, I don't know if I have the uh, permission to go into those details. But what I know there's a challenge, as, as I have been briefed. But as I said, I would have loved for the Ministry of Defense to come up to actually address whatever challenges they are going through. Because if, if you pick up a school, which is not necessarily meant to put out, uh, it, 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 I would prefer, because I can't give all the details. I can I, understand that. Yeah. But you see, it is, it is, it is for some worrying, mm. because I'm sure you followed some of the MPP's press conferences mm. uh, in which they've tried to, may I use the word, attack directly President mm. Mahama. Mm. And they have mentioned that particular deal mm. in trying to link him. And that's why we go back to the question of, well, does the silence help? The question is, um, where does President Mahama come in? That is the first question I want to ask. Is it because a few times he had made visits to Brazil? Does that make him, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, put him in that position where he becomes the final uh, one that should bear the brunt? This is a deal that the Ministry of Defence, um, as as a, as a body or as an institution, is supposed to be handling, you know. And sometimes, for me, that is a problem I have when there are issues to deal with. Yes, he's the one that the box stops with. But it looks like we, the NPP, as you rightly mentioned, always want to find something to taint the current president because now the challenge looks a bit of a tall order for them. And these are, as much as I am aware, the problem with this Embraer thing is more technical than financial. Okay. Okay, so... Um, I would have loved for the Ministry of Defense to give clarity on this particular issue because um, we've heard on uh, platforms of the NPP where uh, their members or their communicators go about, oh, we bought a plane, uh, what do they call it, an aeroplane uh, garage for a certain amount and all of that. I'm sure they're referring to the hangar. Hangar and all. You see, mm -hmm. for the truth be told, um, we've gotten to the point where uh, if we want to go into such details uh, as to who and or what and what went into buying this or what and what went into buying what, we will all have problems with things we have purchased from the one that Ghana had independence. Because what I will, or the specifications that I will put out for a particular thing may not necessarily satisfy you, for which reason you may raise concerns about it and even assume that somebody is chopping something from it. Kobna. And this system is becoming unbecoming of this nation. Kobna, because otherwise, your we are getting to a point where we can't even take decisions yeah. anymore. Let me hear your thoughts, uh, uh, Kobna, on whether or not government should be actively you know, defending itself. You are hoping, I am imagining, the MPP is hoping, uh, the government will be drawn into this debate of defending its record on the subject of corruption. They seem to have taken uh, you know, a backseat. Corruption is very, very, very important in Ghana. Looks like we've been playing it to the to the back banner. And uh, we don't seem to it cares, it determines what happens in election. But let me go to and quote from Nana Kufuado's statement. She's, to let you know the effect of corruption. Which statement is this? The one that he, why Ghana cannot afford corruption. Okay. Okay. Corruption has been a debilitating factor in the management of our public finances so far. And it has become an even more dangerous factor now that we have oil and our economy is expanding but not creating the needed jobs. 
as experience around the world has shown, if we do not get our basics right, the increase in our resources envelope will spell disaster instead of providing the means for us to solve the many problems that we have, the so-called oil case. I hope all of us in this room are aware of the dangerous corruption poses to our nation. The dangerous corruption poses to our nation. But it is, not, it is worth bearing in mind that it is not only the headline corruption, the type that involves politicians that retards our progress and hinders our development. The driver who knowingly puts a faulty vehicle on the road with the intention of paying bribes to the traffic policeman, the policeman who takes a bribe to ally on a licensed driver on the roads, the planning official who allows a house to be constructed on the waterway, the custom official that accepts a bribe and allows goods in without the payment of duties, the official that allowed drugs to be imported into and exported out of our country, and all the everyday petty bribe taking that we will all put up with. All such actions constitute corruption and retard our progress, even if they do not attract headlines. Bring it up, bring it up, Morris. Yes. And that's what you stress the importance of corruption, how it hurts this nation. Okay? Martin Amidu has come out and issued a series of statements indicting this government that they are corrupt. At one time, he issued a statement, you dare me and I will expose you. They shut up. No, we dared him. They shut up. All right, so he knows what he's talking about. In our own parlance, if he says that the, the so then chem Frinsuasi Bekachos, the Bumutre Frinsuasi Bekachos, or then chem Wa, you don't doubt him. To wit. Okay, to wit, what Martin Amidu is saying is the truth, and that is why they cannot respond. That is why they cannot respond. Everything he has said is what they have done. They went in there and using institutionalized corruption. This is the first time we have a government in our history institutionalizing corruption through what they call judgment debt, through what the, the use of you see, our procurement law. All right, the procurement law has a clause in there that says sole sourcing, and this government pounced on it to the extent that even when they are putting asphalt on East Legon Road, they did it under sole sourcing. Asphalting a road that is already there, which has not been cut into two, which has not been blocked, which has not been made impassable, you did it with sole sourcing. That is institutionalized corruption. It is these things that Martin Amidu is saying, that is why they cannot talk about it. All right? Kojo, they can't. They can't answer. Rollins has been talking about the same thing. It's not only Martin Amidu. These are important people within the party. Rollins is the founder. And he's talked about this so much. He has not been writing, but he has been talking. It's only Martin Amidu who is writing and telling us this is what these guys are doing. They institutionalize it with their intention to punish MPP. They will pay judgment debts and use the payment of judgment debts to go and prosecute MPP officials. This is what they are doing. You see, but when you do things that makes it, uh, brings issues about it, it lets people talk about your intentions. Because there are certain things that if you don't have intention to steal, you will never do. Look at SGX. You are going to build 30,000 houses. About 60% of those houses are one and two bedroom houses. More than 60%. One and two bedroom houses. Over 20,000 of those houses are one and two bedroom houses. You give the, the, this, the contractor sovereign guarantee. Sovereign. Beautiful enough. Nobody has uh, this and doubts that. You go to the extent at attaching political risk insurance to it. And you value that insurance $260 million. 
That $260 million at the price they gave to Parliament for one bedroom house at $12,500 can build 20,000 of those houses. And when you do this and I sit around and I tell you, I tell you, you don't have a, a plan to steal? Because if you don't want to steal, you will never do that. That the insurance that you have attached on that project will build 66% of those houses you are going to build. So maybe the premium was high. How does that necessarily correlate? That corruption? is where the corruption is. That is where the corruption is. Because he's not the first person to buy insurance. He is not the first person to buy insurance. So when you do that, you give people the opportunity to say you have bad, corrupt intentions. You have intentions to steal our money. And everything they have done. Let me give you a letter that some of these things that people talk about, maybe that we, we don't, uh, this and uh, uh, we, you know, uh, uh, African automobile case. Mm -hmm. It was one, one of the judgment dead cases. Yes, one of judgment dead cases. Mm -hmm. They gave a contract to Afri uh, uh, an order to African automobile to supply goods in four months. Four. 22 months later, the goods have not been supplied. The government of Ghana terminated the order. 22 months you have not supplied the goods. It's not that the, good, the, the, the contract was terminated six months after or ten or four months after or the government came in and said, you have this contract, I've terminated it. No. We were given the contract four months. 22 months you've not terminated, you've not supplied. The government terminated it. You came in. Yiratira came in, all right, and wrote a letter to the company. We will take the cast. The letter that the government wrote to terminate the contract in 2008 has been withdrawn. Then after that, you go and sit down with the same company and start negotiating a $1.5 billion claim against the people of Ghana. What do you think we are? What have we done to NDC? What has the people of Ghana done to NDC? Do you think that the people of Ghana, as they follow some of these charges as are put out you know, by various persons, including the MPP, are necessarily buying into the notion that these charges are real and therefore the NDC is corrupt? Because, and I'm asking that because, you don't get the impression that the NDC is eager to put up a defense beyond what they have said already. They have explained some of these issues, and they're not eager to uh, get, you know, get into a fight with you over some of these things. Yeah. Do you think the people are buying your argument the, that they are corrupt? You know why? Because they have taken the people of Ghana for granted for too long. All right? Ubiaba, sa. They wouldn't even mind saying here right now, MPP has no moral right to talk about corruption. That is what they are saying. Which means MPP talked. So when we have come, we are also going to talk. That's, that's the defense they are putting up. MPP has no moral right to talk about corruption. Anywhere I meet them, that's all they come at. And I bet you, oh, 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 listen, I, my honorable adversary, if you get the opportunity, that's precisely what he's going to say. <laughs> you are not predicting his thoughts. Please wrap up for no, me and then let me come to That's precisely what he's going God to say. Wrap up for me and, and let me come to And we just have to God let God the way. people of Ghana know that we cannot accept <laughs> this anymore. <laughs> These people must be bought, voted out and as a message to politicians. And what I'm saying goes to Nana Kufuadu too. That if we vote them out, and Nana Kufuadu you come, and you finish your transformation of the JSS to HSS in four years, and you chop our $3 billion, the people of Ghana must vote you out. This is what I'm saying. This is a message. It's almost 10 o'clock. This is news file. This is a message. This, for the first time, let Ghanaians send a message to all politicians. Because otherwise, they will take us for granted and come and chop our money. And after that, tell you, I've done six classrooms. I've given three million school uniforms. Okay. I've given free exercise books. I've done this. Point I've made. done that. Point and made. then they point chop made. the $10 billion free of charge. Come on, point to me. Uh, it's 10 o'clock right now. This is a news file on Joy 99.7 FM and on the Joy News channel on Multi TV. Uh, uh, Godwin Adagwene is a lawyer and a lecturer. Let me bring him in. Uh, does silence mean consent here? On this particular matter, <coughs> I don't think that the government has uh, necessarily been silent on every aspect of the charges that have been leveled against it. There are some of them that they have not responded to. And I'm here talking about the latest charge that Mr. Madden Amido has uh, leveled against them. 
it may well be a strategy to ignore him and to ignore what he's been saying. It may well be that they are planning their defense. It could be either one of them. But to me, the point is, these are matters that relate to the public interest. And when there are questions of improper handling of matters that relate to the public interest, the public deserve to know what the situation is. It is government that is in a position to tell us what exactly the situation is relative to the issue that Mr. Martin Abidu has, uh, has raised. To that extent, the silence can mean a problem for us. Because we, we, we can't tell whether what he's saying is true or false. If it is true, that's a big problem of government. If it is false, that also is another problem. But what it, whatever it is, we need to, to, to know. And government has a responsibility to let us know whether or not the issues that have been raised are true or false. But on the issue of corruption, well, every government since uh, independent or even beyond, I mean, as far back as 1954, 51, has had its share of uh, the issue of corruption. And various methods have been applied over the years to deal with it. And in some cases, even the persons involved in dealing with the problem get caught up in it. And I'm, I'm sure that Ghanaians have not forgotten I mean, what happened in uh, 1979, what happened in 1981. I mean, those were, I mean, the measures adopted uh, in those times were, I think, the most drastic, I mean, ever in our national history. But the problem doesn't seem to be going. And the NDC has had a chance, eight years, corruption. Charges have been leveled against them. The MPP has had a chance, eight years, corruption I mean, has always been leveled against them. The NDC is about ending it, I mean, a fourth term, I mean, it's a first term, second term of coming to power, corruption. And I can assure you, you always have it. It's the human nature. But to me, the problem is what exactly are the institutional arrangements that we have uh, put in place to deal with those uh, issues? We can't trust the politicians to solve the problem of corruption for us because they are in charge of their resources. They manage their resources. And it is in the process of managing their resources that these issues of corruption come up. So we may well have to begin to think of innovative ways of dealing with that. And that is why I think the right to information as a legal enforceable right can to some extent uh, solve this problem okay. because it will open up, I mean, some of the, the points of decision making to public view, except those that relate to national security and then other matters which we can all agree that can be treated with some level of uh, secrecy for the sake of the integrity of the society as a whole. So to me, that is, I mean, that is what we should be looking at. But as for the platform political challenge, they will always come. And unless we adopt an, inno an innovative way of dealing with it, particularly opening up government, we will always have this problem. Of Mr. Martin, let me do, uh, you know, uh, profess some suggestions in his paper or his uh, latest epistle as we like to call it here on news yeah. where he says that uh, and even though he doesn't say it in those words it sounds uh, like he's talking about adopting you know what they very often do in the u.s where they have these bipartisan congressional committees that do a lot more of these investigations so that you can have a bit more confidence in the process because as has been said in times past sometimes when you expect uh, whoever is in power to investigate his own or even if you expect a state agency to uh, you know investigate somebody from the executive who pays their budget it wouldn't happen. Well, uh, let's look at it from this uh, perspective. We have the 92 Constitution, which is the fundamental law, that creates the most important structures of governance that we need to manage our development challenges. Now, we have various institutions. We have the police service. We have the church, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. We have parliament itself. We even have the institution of the commission on inquiry, which the executive can set up. In all of these, it is true that somebody or some group 
of persons may have to compose the particular entity to deal with them. Beyond that, the individuals composed are supposed to be trained intellectually or technically in the subject area. They also are supposed to have some level of integrity and moral standing. To that extent, we cannot always say without evidence that simply because Kojo has appointed Mr. Abdul Malik, necessarily he would to whatever line that Kojo would want him to to. Because he also has a professional integrity to protect. He has a personal reputation to protect. And I believe that between towing your line and then protecting that, there are some who will keep to protecting their integrity and all of that. Mm. So we do not, we should not always have to push the cynicism too far. Otherwise, we will create a situation <coughs> where there will be no institution that we can trust to handle some of these matters for us. Now, let's look at the issue at stake, particularly with respect to the, the, the Sewell Commission and then the bipartisan thing. Well, the, the person appointed is a judge. He's a judge of the Superior Court. He has practiced all this while. His peers in the profession do not have problem with his competence, with his integrity, and all of that. So what other reason do we have to doubt that he can do a good job of the matter? The challenge coming up, and I'll go to Kweku Baku shortly, because I notice he's eager to make a comment. The challenge we have, for instance, uh, just before I go to Kweku, the challenge we have, for instance, with the uh, appointment of uh, Justice Apoa as a sole commissioner, mm -hmm. uh, is a legal challenge. There are legal questions being raised. That So when was the CI sent to Parliament to mature in 21 days uh, to give his commission a legal foundation uh, based on which it can really do its job. Number two, uh, you know, even if you look at the CI 79, in terms of its powers and what it can do to persons that it has invited, there are questions there. Number three, uh, how does his work complement or take away from ongoing court cases? And so even when you seek to use some of these bodies, there are those who have legal questions. Well, I do not think that when the president exercises his right to set up I mean, to institute, to set up I mean, a, a commission of inquiry by means of a constitutional instrument, that constitutional instrument must of necessity go to parliament. You see, we have some regulations, we have some rules, we have some orders that are enacted pursuant to an act of parliament and are of what we call a legislative character. Those ones must of necessity go to parliament. But when the president exercises his power to make an executive order, which is of an executive character and not of a legislative character, and not pursuant to an act of parliament, there <coughs> is no requirement to go to parliament. Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, I've please. heard those who make the legal argument always refer to Article 11.7 to back the argument that it must go to parliament. That's precisely the point I'm making. Okay, and I'm looking for the authority that those who say it mustn't go to parliament are basing the argument on. What's the authority for that? Oh, executive, instrument don't, don't, executive instrument don't go to parliament. But well, I, I, can, I can give you. Yeah, the I CI can give you. and course. LIs go to parliament. Yes. Legislative instrument, constitutional instruments go. Executive instruments are just prerogative of the president's decision. That I is understand. why. Which is why I'm trying to find the authority for that. Yes, with the case of a constitutional instrument, I recall a similar incident had been occurred under the 1979 constitution, and the matter was decided I mean, by the late Cecilia Rantinado. And the question was whether I mean, a constitutional instrument, I mean, which was the same formulation as this one, ought to go to parliament. And her ruling was that it, it doesn't have to go to parliament. But even when you read the general literature, on administrative law and constitutional law. There is that general understanding that even with constitutional instruments enacted by the president in the nature of an executive order, does it need to go to parliament? Even in our recent history, if my I mean, facts are right, when President Kufu set up the Stadium Disaster Committee. Co commission, Com I mean, headed by uh, some I don't or think even the Ghana at 50 commission. I do not think that, I mean, that's consideration. But again, I'm worried whether that, again, is, you know, authority, that the fact that President Kufo did it because... No, I'm just, I'm just giving you, I mean, a precedent yes. to, to make the point that it's not only President Kufo, even before him, 
and I mean, uh, before him, the matter went to court, and there's a judicial, I mean, a decision on that matter. One may criticize the decision for one reason or the other, but once it stands as a decision of the court, we can refer to it as as, as a legal, I mean, a point to make. So, but on the issue of the the bipartisan committee, I mean, we have the public accounts committee, composed of, I mean, by the two uh, parties in parliament. How has that committee performed? How do you think it's performed? To me, it has been so polarized that public confidence in the way it has carried out some of these things is waning. So it's the same demerit or the same weakness that you will find. I mean, a weakness in the sense that the institutions are operated by human beings. Mm -hmm. So our human weaknesses will necessarily manifest in some of the things that we are entrusted to do. And so for you, the best approach is? For me, let's give the benefit of the doubt to the current institution that has been put in place. Let the sole commissioner give us the reason to say that this method is not the best. Or let the sole commissioner give us the reason to say that, well, so far it has done well. So we should all give, I mean, it has, if the president for now who has the authority to, to take the decision, he has taken it, we may criticize it, but let's give our support to the sole commissioner and let's see how well Quick, let me hear you, and then I'll go around well, for uh, final comments on this uh, subject before I'm we move on. I'm not a lawyer. You know that uh, I don't have serious legal brains. And of course, I also didn't know about this uh, precedent that he cited. That's quite an interesting Could you please speak up a bit? So I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to engage in any serious legal Gymnastics. So yes, <laughs> that's right. But the point is, I also didn't know about the precedent that he cited. It would be useful for later. us to mm. educate And you're saying that ruling was based on the 1979 Constitution. Constitution? I mean, which also the same as, I mean, this one. Okay. It may be also interesting to interrogate what the provisions in that Constitution said about uh, those things. But proceed yes, with your yes, argument. Because my, if you look at the Article 278 1, it says, subject to Article 5 of this Constitution, the President shall, by constitutional instrument, appoint a commission of inquiry into any matter of public interest shall by a constitutional instrument. Uh, that is where my worry is, because it's specific. Yes. By constitutional instrument. Then the 11 seven, as you said, is any other rule or regulation made by a person or authority under a power conferred by this constitution or any other law shall be laid before parliament, be published in the Gazette on the day it is laid before uh, parliament, and come into force at the expiration of 21 sitting days after being so late, unless well, that's so, so, so we all know uh -huh. what it means. Uh -huh. uh, so really, I need to get educated on that precedent and see if it helps this case. Because you see, the point that that may have happened even the Waku Commission or Ghana 50 Commission or the Constitutional Review Commission, I don't know whether all those instruments were placed before Parliament. If they were not, and today somebody sees that this was a, def a deficit or a defect, and takes it up, that person may still win. But the fact that we are created a convention of wrongdoing will not, you know, mitigate the, a new wrong, a, new, a wrongdoing that we've now seen. So in terms of the law, but as I said, I'm inadequate when it comes to that. So I will run away quickly from that area and <laughs> come to where I'm more comfortable to deal with. Uh, back to the issue. See, the you thing, I have fortunately found the statement. It's my job online, uh, 26 July 2011, and I would want to read it. The headline was, Government clarifies its consent to Talo Oil and Euro Group. The government of Ghana says it has become aware of reports in sections of the media suggesting that government has abandoned its ongoing investigations of the Euro Group, and that in exchange, government has received reparation from the EU group. In a statement signed by the Energy Minister, Dr. Joe Otinaji, government categorically denied the reports and explained that what has taken place is government's consent for Talo Oil to enter into contractual arrangements with the EU group for an eventual takeover of the latter shares in the Jubilee oil field. And this is most significant, the third paragraph. Mr. Otinaji added, that the transaction does not in any way indemnify the EU group from an ongoing criminal investigations which can lead to a possible criminal prosecution. The statement concluded 
that the government of President John Evans Atamiros will not undermine the national interest and remains committed to the fight against corruption. We should hold government accountable to this statement. Some months down <coughs> the line, a former attorney general is making an allegation, and I want to be charitable with allegation, to the effect that something went wrong with the executive concern. I think government did the right thing. That's my own opinion. Mm -hmm. Because from day one, they were pursuing a political vendetta agenda. They had no case. In your opinion? Oh, <laughs> brother, they mm -hmm. had no case. And that's why we ended up where we ended up. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. And it was good they did what they did at that time. It so has to show that at least they had some heart for Ghanaian business initiative. But, you see, in the terms of public accountability, you told the public something. You told the public that you are granting the executive consent, but the ongoing criminal investigations is pending, and that it could lead to criminal prosecution. It didn't, as we speak. If an attorney general is alleging corruption to that, he's trying to read corruption into that, meaning that something may have happened. And I've heard all sorts of stories about something did happen. It is in government's own interest, especially when this pub statement was made public. I don't see why government should run away from a p another public statement clarifying the situation. Mr. What says is the that status? If you look at the form uh, in which these statements are coming and the posture of Mr. Um, Amidu, it's not exactly you know exciting for them to be engaging him. Well, I'm looking. I'm looking even beyond Martin Amidu at this stage. Even though I say his status is something you cannot ignore, mm -hmm. but I'm looking at a larger public interest picture. That's what I'm looking at. We've elected the government, and the government is elect uh, accountable to us. And government found reasons to issue this statement at the time it issued. Because there was this perception or rumor that uh, some reparation had been paid. We had given up the criminal investigation. There was also the grapevine one that some people had even been, uh, uh, palms had been greased. I, I don't want to put that out here because it's unverifiable, you know. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the point is, in the name of a transparency and accountability, government ought to tell us something. As for the purchase of the aircraft, I have little information, little or no information, but I still think it stands on the same leg that there should be some official response. You see, when we are not satisfied, I'm sorry, when we are not satisfied with the quality or substance of the responses, then there could be a basis. To uh -huh. That's my view. Okay. I think preliminary. It is so much important, it's so in the public interest that say something, tell us something. We are all discerning people. If the reasons come, the explanation come, and it's not solid, we will know where to proceed further to. And if it is, sleeping dogs will. Let me give final comments you. to Kavna and then Honorable Edouard and then we'll go for a break. In the first place, Mr. Edouard Martin Amundi cannot fight from within because he's been kicked out. He's been kicked out. So how do you expect him to go and sit down with the government to discuss all these things. He has to tell us. And he's doing the right thing, just like J.J. Rollins. All right? And when he comes to, look, let me give you an example of Quickly, corrupt, just corrupt like two minutes, act. And then we'll finish. This is a Supreme Court judgment. And a case involving somebody, a company has sued the state of Ghana for 141 billion CDs. The NDC, when they came to power, this case was in court. And when they decided to steal and they started taking all those monies, yeah, out, all those cases out of court to settle, that. they forgot this? to take this case out of court to settle. Okay. And after they have chopped the money, they say, wait a minute, we've got more money there to chop. So they went to the judge who was deciding on the case. <laughs> Who was deciding on the case and told the and told the judge, please? Is that in the case you are showing me? Yes, that's the case. I'll show you the page where it is. That's we, part of the ruling. That's part of the ruling. Please, we forgot something. You, you don't know there's too much money to be chopped. Wait Listen, a no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, 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 you are boring on an area that I don't honestly believe was written that way in that judgment. So well, you make your substantive point. My substantive I'll let him my react. Substantive During the break, you can show me that one, and then my, I'll let you. My make that point. is inside. Mm -hmm. And he knows how these people have been operating. They are so corrupt. So corrupt that at, at times you think that they have been cursed. They went to this judge. A judge before the judge was going to give the judgment, he said, wait a minute. We are prepared to pay the 141 billion CDs. So rule the case against the state or let's take the case out and we pay the money. The judge said, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I recall I that. I work too. on law and I'll make my decision based on the formation available to me. 
The judge went ahead, made a decision, and offered 1,141 CDs African to the... Automobile. Yes, yes. that's 1,141. Yes. That one he did. Have. Yes. 1,141. And these guys wanted the judge to make a decision that the state will pay 141 billion. But these persons billion. were not party officials. These were state... State! State they, officials. Who, who controls the attorney general? Well, that's... Who uh, controls the attorney general's office? That. Wrap up for me and then let me come to Mr. Dwasari. Mr. Dwasari, final comments and then I'll go for a break. I'll read you another letter uh, written by this, this man. Could you? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you're right, right. I'll read that letter. Quickly, I have just like two you minutes see, to go for a break. If you hear desperate people talk, you can see it. And for me, I'm not surprised to hear my senior brother, Kwabuna uh, Sapon, go this, you know, please. If he knew they are guilty, so he prepared the grounds and said in his earlier submission that yes, he knew or he knows I'm going to go on a certain tangent. If you had your hand so stained, you know it. And you turn around, sit here in your righteous mood to pontificate what? He was talking about prices of buildings for this STS project. Could you go to behind 37 military hospital? They have put up some houses there for senior uh, medical officers and all of that. This was in 2007. One house there cost $250,000. That is what is on record, which was brought to Parliament on the test report. 2007, four-bedroom house, $250,000. And you are sitting here talking about what? I did a calculation here. He said $260 million, which was, meant, was supposed to be paid for uh, insurance, could build 20,000 houses. 20260 Divided by 20,000, you are talking about $13,000. Uh, you should show me where in Accra you can get one bedroom self contained for $13,000. Where in Accra? In conclusion, the point I'm making here is that you see, let's not. People who are listening to us, I believe, are very discerning people. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, we shouldn't just trivialize issues for the political expediency of it, right? We are analyzing serious issues here. You can't just get up, like a lawyer said. Corrupt, corrupt, corrupt everywhere. That is what we are doing. The police is corrupt. General Stamp. So the policeman who is even cooking at the cookhouse is corrupt. And so for you, the, the one policing the senior man's kanka, shoes. The best way for you to deal with this kanka is is to attack issues one. I would like take issues as they come. Because you see, the NPP, I want to make it point blank before I, I hang up. NPP is as, as tainted in terms of corruption. If but you give me the you are saying take the issues one yes. by one as they are. Mr. Amidu has done that. You are not responding no, to no. that. No, no. The, the point that you are making here, I've told you, Mr. Amidu is not the one to tell us how to govern, uh, whatever. We have people, when he left, Somebody was put in his place, <coughs> okay? If at the time he was there, he made this opportunity available to the people. He is claiming here that he made attempts, but there is no such record anywhere. He should show us letters that he sent to the chief of staff and all of those things. Okay. His quoting meetings they held and all of that. There is no record. Okay. So he should show us okay. that attempt rather than to sit back and try to piss in. I hear your defense. I hear your defense. It's 24 minutes after 10. Uh, Apani Al-Hassan says, Martin is a real man, a man of integrity who loves Ghana and speaks for the right things to be done in government. We all love Aziz Ghana. Aziz in London says, the MPP government on the 20th of November 2007 ordered the Minister of Finance to pay $275,000 out of the $750 million euro bond to Mercer Standard & Poor's and Fitch Ratings Limited respectively for purported consultancy services to rate Ghana B+. What was that? Uh, David Anafo says, it's funny how people discuss and downplay issues of corruption in Ghana. We are quick to ask people to submit evidence uh, when we are aware that corruption has been so institutionalized that all the people who matter, whether politicians, directors, accountants, auditors, security men, gain from it and as such put measures in place to cover it up. It started, uh, I started my career in a district assembly as a district development officer and I had to quit because of the levels of corruption. 
at the assembly. Andrew, let's get into our second conversation. Let's talk about the name Rawlings and the factor that it may bring or may not bring in the 2012 elections. Incidentally, my very first book I uh, read, my very first political book I read uh, in senior high school was titled Ghana, the Rawlings Factor. So let's talk about the Rawlings factor in the 2012 <coughs> elections. Uh, he's now affirmed support for his wife. He says, uh, you know, he would support her in all that she does. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean he will support the NDP. But talking of the NDP, he says it's a credible party. And like he has supported all other credible political forces, he will support this one too. And then uh, he just had a meeting with the NPP's flag bearer, Nana Akufuado. Question, how much of an impact will, will, will these maneuvers, if I can call them so, have uh, on the fortunes of the MPP and the NDC in the 2012 elections. Mr. Dwasari, let me start with you. You are from within. <laughs> Kojo, um, I think uh, you described this whole thing right. The Rollins factor in, uh, Ghanaian, in the Ghanaian politics. Perhaps right. just before you do that, let me play for the benefit of our viewers and our listeners just a little clip of that meeting with Nanado. Ghana has come a long way, and there's no need and there's no reason why there should be a decline here. Let us use this opportunity, irrespective of whoever wins, to make the most, to give this country the necessary leap she needs. Time has come in our country where the principal actors in the political scene find a way to talk to each other rather than at each other, which has been the case in our country for a long time. And to very, very concerned, all of us are, and I know you are very much so, about making sure that these elections in December are conducted in a good spirit, in a peaceful manner. No matter what happens in the change of power, their basic political, civil rights, their own personal uh, lives are, are not endangered in any way. I think it's very important. Because we, that's where we have to get to in Ghana, a situation whereby the change of power in itself doesn't pose a threat or a danger to any particular section of our society. And I'm very keen that that signal goes out. It's part of the reason why I came to visit you. So I'm very happy today to see the two of you together. It's been a long-held dream of mine and has been realized. In fact, I may not be very active on the campaign trail, so you can rest assured. <laughs> I may not, I said. <laughs> so you can rest assured that uh, I, you probably wouldn't be hearing the tia tia. No. <laughs> uh, welcome back. Those are just a few excerpts of uh, that meeting. Mr. Dresser, you were making a point. Yeah, uh, but could you, let me be very frank with you. You just played an ad, <laughs> NTA. And for me, their service in the last two weeks has been very, very terrible. Oh, horrible. Okay. No, I must be honest with you. I have never made one call, complete call. Okay. And I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Us. I'm sure we can draw the uh, attention of yes, the appliance please. service department. I, I to think it, they should to be, deal with it. Yeah, it, it's not fair. Okay. I hear you. At all. I hear you. We'll draw okay. the attention of the appliance service department. Much. Make your point, sir. Right. Kojo, on the founder of uh, the NDC, uh, President Rawlings, I will describe him as a very uh, enigmatic character, one that you cannot predict, one that you cannot easily um, guess what his next move it's going to look like, or how his, best, his next move is going to look like. And for me, I belong to one of the group of uh, that school of thought that Rollins should be steadied. And this whole research team should be uh, made to steady the character of President Rollins so that we can, if, if it fits into uh, the political science structure, we should find something in that area to fit him in there. Because yes, um, this is our founder. And all of us, some time back, thought that uh, issues that had to do with his wife's 
plan to even contest the lead president at the primaries. Um, was not well seated with the people of the NDC or the members of the NDC. But of course, we thought he could do something about it. Um, nothing happened. That issue is history. She contested President Mills and lost heavily. So we were also of the view that, yes, come uh, the aftermath of that program, uh, we all rally together and fight what were the common uh, opponents that we have. Then the rumors of a new party will be set up, a new party will be set up. Today, that is also history. We don't have all of the Rawlinses supporting the NDC because two days ago she resigned uh, uh, from the NDC, so she is no longer a member of the NDC. NDP has come up, and I think this morning they are having their Congress. Mm. But before then, President Rollins was at who, and before even that program, he was in uh, Kumasi. And this was right at a point where his uh, popularity, if I should put that, uh, if I can use that word, at the point where President Mills died, the comments he made on BBC sent his, or reduced his, his, his uh, image to an all-time low. Okay, to the extent that some of us, what we witnessed at some of the places, uh, the funeral grounds and other places we met him, was really not the best. Then again, soon after that, some overtures have been made. And then the Congress at Kumasi, and subsequently the uh, manifesto launch in Ho, has, you know, dramatically, you know, pushed in all the way to the top. And it's all because the members of NDC have rallied behind him all over again. And I think President Rollins should take note of that. That he, he can, or, or his existence, or let me say, uh, maybe not existence, but like his, his continuous stay on the political platform, the scene, depends on the NDC and no other party. That's a very interesting point, a very categorical point you are making. Yes, because as, as I've, I've given you two scenarios. Mm -hmm. When he was at an all-time low, and soon after, after a few overtures were made, Boudin and consultations here and there, pep talks from you know, the president himself to other people, communication team, and all of that. So in other words, if he is with the NDC, mm -hmm. uh, he will have an impact. If he is not, uh, he will not have an impact. That's what you're saying. For me, that is what I see. Mm -hmm. So that whatever the ND NDP does, yes, it is his wife who has opted to become the flag bearer for the N NDP. And it's going to be difficult for a ha the husband to cut or like leave it to herself. So certainly, I, if, I, if I were in his shoes, I wouldn't do anything different, at least to offer some support from that perspective. But as to whether NDP or Rollins, he has said it categorically, that he is not leaving the NDC. Mm -hmm. He has said that categorically for mm -hmm. us, we are okay with it. So between NDP, NDC, I don't really see too much of a challenge. Because as I have said, President Rollins should know by now that his strong base is hinged on his support, continuous support, or remaining with the NDP, NDC. But the problem is what happened two days ago. Why is that a problem? Yes, because I think that President Rollins has been dealing with issues in, within the NDC. 
he raises issues about greedy <coughs> bastards. He raises issues about uh, the babies with babies sharp teeth. with sharp teeth and evil dwarfs now. Evil dwarfs, little twitches, um, all of those things. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I was of the view that, yes, reconciliation should start from within. So start from within. If there is any uh, restitution or whatever, the heart that is open for forgiveness, it should start from home. So that all these little twitches, greedy bastards, two babies with teeth and old evil dwarfs should have been the first point of call for reconciliation so that it doesn't appear as if when you are out you, you prefer to you know show your magnanimity and your good nature to out as i'm putting outsiders in quotes Meanwhile, at home, at home, you have trouble. challenges. I'll okay. come back to you, Mr. Dua. Sorry, yeah. we are 16 minutes away from 11. Now, my uh, directors uh, informed me that we are getting a lot of calls from many lawyers <laughs> who are expressing different views on this uh, <coughs> need or the requirement to take the CI that sets up the commission chaired by a sole commissioner to parliament. Uh, so we're going to have two of those lawyers join us on the phone lines for a quick chat on the various views based on the precedent that is being cited. Uh, Etc. Is Ankuma is a legal practitioner with uh, Binti Enchil, Lecha and Ankuma. Mr. Ankuma, uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. He's joining us with uh, Dominic Ayine, uh, who is also a legal practitioner. Dr. Dominic uh, Ayine. Doc, good morning to you as well, and thank you for joining yeah, us. Good morning. Good morning, Pedro. Um, Is are you there with me? Yes, I'm here with you. Coach. Okay, so let me start with you, and then I'll go to um, Dr. Ayine. Uh, what's your position on this matter? Does it need to go to Parliament? Does it not need to? We have been told of a precedent. Uh, some time ago, based on the 1979 constitution, that says it's of an executive character and doesn't need to go to parliament. Um, you, there are three kinds of instruments that the uh, law recognizes, both under the Statutory Instruments Act and under the Interpretation Act. One is called a constitutional instrument. The other is called a legislative instrument. And the third is called an executive instrument. A constitutional instrument is an instrument that is issued pursuant to a power given to a person under the Constitution. A, statute, um, a legislative instrument is an instrument that is issued or enacted pursuant to a power given to a person under a piece of legislation. An executive instrument is issued by the executive arm of government to implement executive decisions. There are three different instruments. Now, the Constitution is clear that as long as you are so expected to pass a constitutional instrument, it must go to Parliament. And it's Article 11.7 is clear. This is not an executive instrument, but it is a constitutional instrument. And the Constitution demands that it must go to Parliament, whatever it is going to do. Now, the so-called precedent from 1979 is a case of ex parte Bombay. Bombay was deported from Ghana under the Aliens Act. The interior minister, issued an executive instrument for the purpose of his being removed. His lawyers went to court to say that under the parallel provision under the 1979 Constitution, that executive instrument should have gone to Parliament. Note, it was an executive instrument. It is the executive arm of government that was acting um, under a power donated, but it was a completely executive act. So the, 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 the Supreme Court explained that once it is completely executive, it ought not to have gone to Parliament, and that it is not covered under the definition, under, I believe it was Article 3 or Article 4 of the St. Constitution, which is similar to our Article 11.7. So, expert Bombelli dealt with an executive instrument, okay. a different genre of instrument. It has nothing to do with a constitutional instrument. Okay, hold it. A constitutional instrument. Hold it for me. Go to Parliament. Hold it for me. I want to speak to uh, Dr. Dominic Aine, who has a different view. Doc, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Kojo. You think it doesn't need to go to Parliament? Yes, I do. Why? Uh, and the reason is simply because the distinction that A has drawn is more related to form than to substance. The reason why subsidiary legislation of any kind or subsidiary instruments of any kind have to go to parliament is basically to ensure parliamentary oversight of the exercise of governmental power. So that, for instance, if there is a, as he has rightly pointed out, 
an executive instrument that is not of a legislative character, it should not go to parliament. And there's authority for that as he has conceded. However, there are constitutional instruments that are regulative in character. And those are caught by Article 11, 7 of the Constitution. If there is a direct grant of constitutional power to the executive to do anything, and the executive is exercising that power, but not in a, in a manner to regulate, it doesn't affect anybody's rights, okay? And on the face of it, if you look at uh, CI 79, you will not find anything that I mean, it's of a, a, I mean, that is regulatory in character or legislative in character. Now, my point is that if you subject everything that the executive is doing to legislative, I mean, oversight, then you are in running the principles of the separation of powers. And the, the reason why we have separate the <coughs> powers is simply because, first of all, we need to protect the liberty of the citizen. But secondly, and more importantly, we need to have a workable government. An American Supreme Court justice once put it more, be I mean, beautifully when he said that the Constitution disperses powers, the better to secure liberty. But it contemplates that the dispersed powers will integrate into a workable government. So if you want the executive every time that it is exercising direct grants of constitutional power that, are, that is not legislative in character to go for parliamentary oversight, then what you are simply doing is, you know, subjecting the, the executive, you know, to the supervision of the legislature okay. all the time. And two, that, that was not no, 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 okay, okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, okay, no, two no, questions, no, two no, questions, no, two no, questions, no, two no, questions, no, one for no, Dr. Ayina no, and then one for Ace. No, and then I'll give you both an opportunity to wrap up because uh, we've got to, you know, tie it up nicely. Uh, Doc, I heard Mr. Ankuma give us authority for his argument. What is the authority for this distinction that if it's regulatory <laughs> in character? Can you help us out, well, sir? You know, in law, an authority need not always be... <laughs> um, you know, a court decision. For instance, Benyon, you know, who was, I mean, a, a who drafted our first, you know, constitution, mm -hmm. says it very, very clearly in his book on the constitutional law of Ghana. He draws that same distinction very, very clearly. And he is the one who drafted the Statutory Instruments Act that uh, my friend Dr. Nkuma was, uh, you know, was referring to. Sorry, I call, I call him Dr. Nkuma. There is a reason for that. <laughs> 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 okay, I understand All you, right. Dr. Uh, Ayine, and I thank you. Ace, wrap up for us okay. quickly. What do you make? Oh, look, we are talking of our 1992 constitution. Indeed, um, Dominic would note that the statutory instrument act that Benyam drafted has seen quite some amendments under the recent amendments and redefinitions. And so those definitions have been made to fit it under the 1992 constitution. The constitution is clear, and it's indeed, so Benyam's authority from 1992, it is not, it's not authority. <laughs> the kind of in the Constitution, which says, and, and indeed, our current statutory instruments are, Benyon can't write something to affect our statutes. Look, the Constitution is clear. It must go to Parliament. You might think it breaches separation of powers. The, the Constitution cannot breach separation of powers. The, the Constitution of Ghana, it determines when the two must act together. And note, this, this Commission is going to have the power to issue subpoenas and to compel the production of documents and the appearance of witnesses. And you say it is not legislative in character. Please, for, to, for the government and its advisors, we have a superb opportunity to deal with this matter. We, have, we cannot have a better judge to deal with this than Justice Abel. He's a fantastic person. Let's give him the tools to deal with this once and for all. Okay. If we get into these arguments, oh, because it's just a minute, and it ends up in the Supreme Court and everything is set aside, then what would we have achieved? What will it cost us? to wait for Parliament to come back, for this instrument to lie before Parliament for 21 days. Okay. So Justice gentlemen, do the job that we I thank you. Do. I thank we you, gentlemen. Careful. Your thoughts have been made clear. <laughs> we thank you. Eight minutes to 11. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, that's uh, lawyer Asan Kuma and Dr. Dominic Aine sharing their thoughts with us. They say when two lawyers are arguing, you just listen to them, and then you can go to um, a court to make a determination on it. Thank you uh, for your thoughts. Uh, I want to read, uh, uh, you know, a quick response we've received from um, a good friend of um, uh, Honorable Edouard Sari, that's uh, Mr. Martin Amidu. Uh, he sent in um, a quick response. I just want to read it. He says, Mr. Otinye Jay's statement, and he's referring to the um, energy minister's statement on the EO group. Um, Mr. Otinye Jay's statement was an untruth <coughs> to deceive the public. 
That is why I wrote my letter reference, and it's given a reference here, telling the president that no prosecution will be done by me after government had issued that consent without my agreement as the AG, as required under Article 88 of the Constitution. The government should publish the letter or deny its content and existence. It is disingenuous for a party rep to ask me to publish a letter with a reference to government, which is on, on file in the AG's office. A copy is also in the Director of Public Prosecution's office. The NDC commentators should consult the government before talking, so they do not say things inconsistent with official record. All I'm doing is asking the NDC to return to our values, so we maintain the integrity of what, set, uh, what we set out to do by founding this party in 1992. Martin, ABK Amidu sent us uh, that thought. We're seven minutes away from 11. Um, Mr. Duasari holds a view that if the former President Rawlings is with the NDC, uh, his political gravitas is established, especially as we go forward for the 2012 elections. He holds a view that if he's not, then it doesn't hold much weight. But you are saying that what for you was worrying was the meeting that just took place because what? Yeah, I was saying that. For me, he's had uh, challenges with some members of the party. So today I don't know, you know who these people are because we seem to be getting new terms to describe you know, very different categories of these people. So we don't know who they are. We've, some of us have pushed to, at least to know who he refer, usually refers to with these uh, terms. But we have not had any answers. But then, if you want to, I don't know what some of these people have done who usually get this kind of description or find these terms to describe them. That is so grave than what Nanado and his team <coughs> did to President Rawlings. The fact that until about three or four days before the MPP left power, his wife was still attending court on charges that the then government had leveled against the wife. And he kept on going to court every day the wife was supposed to appear. They kept him very busy, and I'm sure it came with a cost. I also haven't forgotten the, the inhumane, uh, uh, what will I say, courtesies that were withdrawn from him to the extent that at the point in time, President Rawlings traveled and he took a Nigerian, a wife of an ambassador or something, to get help for him in New York. I also haven't forgotten that the fact that Ted Seven Military Hospital remained a military installation, he couldn't have visited military hospital. All of these things are so legitimate lessons from recent history, but yes. so what? Because of this so what? he shouldn't meet him. I am not saying so. So if all of these grave uh, what will I say? Uh, uh, this thing, whatever, I don't want to use a word, whatever has been, was meted out to him, were meted out to him. And on that day Nanado visited, he could still accept to meet him and go heartily to discuss all of these things. Then I'm calling on him again to use that same heart to forgive this so-called names that I have mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. whoever they are. So that as a, as a people, we can say that, yes, our father, our founder, has a new heart which is prepared to deal nicely with the people perceived to be, you know, his opponents or people who are opposed to whatever ideas or he is opposed to their uh, existence or whatsoever. So this is my challenge, and I will want President Rollins to do me this favor so that NDC can go into this election, even though he says we may not necessarily uh, campaign actively and all of that. We still, as long as he remains our founder, as long as he remains our member, uh, I am calling on him to give us that opportunity. Kobna, I've heard people suggest that all that the Nanado and the MPP sought to do was to get a photo op especially on the back of the challenges that uh, President Rawlings is having with his party, so that you could, you know, knock the NDC some more. Isn't that what you really wanted to do here? Uh, I don't think so. See, Rawlings' situation is a little bit 
I don't know how. Maybe Kwaku can put it in a better way for me. Oh, I <laughs> <laughs> see, because he has he has a good way of describing such things. You see, Rollins, Rollins has a way of measuring political parties in Ghana, and based on three principles: accountability, probity, and uh, whatever you you all of us know that social justice. Social justice. Social justice. He put that on S and PP and condemn us because he felt we failed all these uh, tests. To the extent that he even called Jay Kufua a tie. All right, we failed. And when Rollins, JJ Rollins was saying all this, I was telling myself, JJ, you don't have the moral right to say the just like I say you guys tell or something like that. Because you wanted what insist on your rights. If Ghanaians had insisted on our rights, you would never have been at the castle in 1990. You never have ruled us for about 90, 11 years to add the eight years to, to it. Okay? If you want probity and accountability, you would not have indemnified yourself when you were leaving office. If you met, if you yourself passed that test, then you'd have done away with the indemnity clause. You say, I've worked so passionately and I've met all these conditions that I don't care. You can come, I take that thing off the constitution. And but if you have such a strong opposition down. in principle to what he stands for, then why go to him? Wait a minute, wait a this? minute, wait a minute. Then maybe Rollins heard me from the distance when I was criticizing him on these points. So this time, he decided to apply the same principles to himself. That is the party and DC, which is a member, founder, and the head. He tried this time to apply the three principles and he said they have failed woefully. Woefully. He said in so many ways that these guys have failed so woefully that the people of Ghana should never, never, never leave the Mexican chair. All right? So Rollins, in my opinion, was probably looking for an opportunity to let MPP know that, hey guys, I was wrong. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, you are right. I am, I am, I'm not contradicting you myself. Are. I think Rollins is probably looking for the he opportunity to check. You said so. No, that's what I'm saying. Has he changed his name? No, no, listen. You, have, you are not listening to what I am saying. <laughs> I said when he applied the principle to MPP, we failed, according to him, mm -hmm. to the extent that he even called our leader a tie. Which is the worst description you can give to anybody yeah, so in Ghana. And now, now he's listen, applied the same test to the NDC. Now he's applied it to himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since that when he applied, no, mm -hmm. they are worse and than they before. Better. So that they are worse than what he, he, uh, he, he, he gave us. Mm -hmm. So he's looking for the opportunity to say, okay, guys, I'm sorry. I described oh you like that. Goodness. This <laughs> party that I am in now is worse. That's, that's you that think that's why he agreed to this, this meeting after I your people had requested so. that is, uh, that is my know, feeling. for about three months? That is my don't, feeling. Don't I believe so. Now, I believe so. For and, then, and then look at what NDC <laughs> is doing. <laughs> NDC, when, Jay, when Mills was there, you gave out all sort of descriptions to him, call him a barking dog. At one time, even came that he was not even the founder of your party. There are so many funders. That's what you said. You relegated this guy to the background. Now that you need power. Now, when we are going to elections, you are talking of reconciliation. When you guys were insulting him, where were you? Not you in particular, I'm sorry. When okay. I say where were you, I'm not referring to you anymore. Why didn't you call for reconciliation at that time? So J.J. Rollins, this is a warning to you. NDC need you now. So they are asking for reconciliation. Mm. The moment you go and give yourself to him, be careful. What Do you happens think that his posture 30? will have any impact in whatever happens in yes, December? Yes, it will vary. It will vary because J.J. Rollins influence. was a catalyst in NDC winning power in 2008. But he campaigned for them in 2004. Right. They didn't win. It doesn't matter. But I say in 2008. Well, he campaigned for them in 2000. They lost. He campaigned for them in 2004. They lost. In 2008, he campaigned actively. NDC at one time did not even want Rollins to campaign for them. Really? But 2008, yes, in 2008 elections. Yes. But as he, sta he started going on his own, so there were times that they would put J.J. Rollins will be here when he was no longer going to be seen. So I still believe that at this stage, the way J.J. Rollins' position is, NDC is, is feeling that they need him, but otherwise, why would they make all these overtures? Why? Interesting. Okay. Why, if you don't need him, if he's not important to your elections, 
and you've called him the barking dog, he's go, let it go. Godwin. Why are you doing this now? Godwin, trying to get there are two things I want you to examine for me. Any impact, that's one. And then uh, number two, uh, Mr. Dwasar is suggesting that if really the former president wants to demonstrate that he's that magnanimous, then charity begins at home. Well, if there is need for reconciliation, his point is legitimate. And the question is whether there is such need. And the answer is obvious, because he has always raised concern about the activities of some individuals in the party, individuals whose names he, have, uh, he has not mentioned, and whose exact activities he has not uh, specified, but to speak in general terms. So to that extent, one can see that, yes, I mean, there is need for a reconciliation. And he himself, I think recently, has made a point that some of these individuals were present when he was leader, but he managed to deal with them in a certain way, suggesting that he did not entirely exclude them from his uh, government, but he managed to deal with them. And perhaps they may have been contained because they were of some use to the system at the time and to him, perhaps. And so he, he had to contain them. Now, but reconciliation is not a one-way affair. Perhaps he thinks that it is not possible to reconcile with them. And so he doesn't think that maybe they need um, spending time and making effort to reconcile with them. He has always said that the only condition for reconciliation is a return to his core values. I think that is the point he has made I mean, time and again. Any time that he, I mean, you, you, you ask him, why won't you reconcile with President Kufu? Why will you reconcile with this? He will always remind you that it is his core values. So if you have to accept that, then it means that so long as he remains convinced that those who have departed from the values that he holds and do not seem ready to accept them, then there can be no basis for reconciliation. Perhaps that is how we have to look at it. But I think that it is OK if President Rawlings and Nana Kufuado can meet the way they met and then see the things that they did. To some extent, the political tension will reduce. But for how long, we can tell. But you can also understand the indignation from within the party. He has That's the NDC you from, mean? Yes, from the NDC party. He has listed a number of things that members of the party have had to undergo I mean, in order to protect him, or to, in order to protect his name and his legacy. And they feel that in doing that, some of them also have incurred some liabilities, some disabilities, have made some enemies simply because they belong to the system that he was the leader of. So if they have, I mean, wronged him in any way, and he cannot reconcile with them, but can re easily reconcile with those who were doing those things to him, then they will find it very difficult to accept it. But you see, I mean, this, if we cast our minds back in uh, 1993, there about, when after the stolen verdict was published, and then subsequent to that, the MPP decided that they were ready to do business with the Rawlings regime. There was a similar reaction from the NPP fold, except that at that time, we didn't have the proliferation of the media as we have now. Access to the media was not as it is now. So you couldn't feel <coughs> the scale of the reaction. But reading the newspapers at the time, you could feel the heat of rejection of such moves. And I think not further steps were taken in that regard. I mean, I could be corrected. But the point is, there are certain things that some people cannot take. When they feel betrayed, I mean, there's nothing that you can do to them. He himself feels that he has been betrayed. And then the people who follow him also feel that they have also been betrayed by what he has I mean, done now. But I think that all in all, the NDC <coughs> is based upon the, I mean, it's formed on the basis of the principles of, uh, I mean, the principles that he stood for. They have even institutionalized him as founder of the party. I think that it is a crisis moment for even the legitimacy of the NDC itself. 
and for the political future of Jerusalem. It is a difficult moment because it is, should I join the NDP, should I remain with the NDC? If the wife is going... He says he will support his wife, but he won't leave the NDC. Good. I mean, let's look at what he has said from 1979 to date. According to him, the lady has worked so hard, and anybody in her position will, will do, do so. Her. And he is not ready to leave. I think we can grant him that, and it is fair. It's legitimate. We may not know all that, I mean, has gone on, but you wouldn't expect a normal human being in his position to just say that I won't support my wife. It is unnatural. At the same time, too, is he leaving the party that he has found? You get a point. So if it has taken 30 years plus to build this legacy, at his age, is he going out to find another opportunity to start building again? How long will it take him to build this one? The, the, the failure that he's experiencing from those who supported him and are supporting him, can he guarantee that he, I mean, it will not happen? Already some have started resigning. How many more will resign? And you're referring to the general, sec I mean, the interim general secretary the interim of the general NDP. Secretary. Exactly. And then if you read the daily guides this morning, I mean, they're talking about the entire regional executive of the Upper East Region also resigning. I don't know how bad it's in the newspaper. So these are issues that anybody in the position of Jerusalem will feel a bit I've been, uh, confused. I don't know if he's confused. So I think that, and it's important to also know that the big shots in the party are not talking. And I think that is, I mean, okay. It is the foot soldiers I mean, and the activists, they are talking, and we can ignore those ones. But I think that those who have been with him from day one, I mean, should understand the position that he, he I mean, he So yes, fine. Understand. We understand the, yeah. you know, uh, um, analysis. But yeah. tell me about implications. Could it have any? Well, you should look at it from this perspective. You are going into an election. There are some in the party who would want to see the party win and be in power. And then they will understand that Jerry Rawlings, wherever he's going, is not going to lead the party. He cannot lead the party. To them, if they want to do cost-benefit analysis, I mean, where should they throw their weight behind? They have also had those who have toiled with him from 79, 81, two out. Some of them complain that they have done all of that, but they haven't seen any real benefit in their lives. So should they stay and support a system that they believe has some chance of winning, or should they follow him, I mean, his wife, I mean, when they are not so convinced. Particularly so when he himself has said that he's not leaving the party. If you're not leaving the party, would you want to see your party go into opposition? Or so which of these considerations will hold sway at the end of the day? On the average, rational, normal, <coughs> thinking voter, I think that they will stay with him in the NDC and they will work for the NDC to win. I don't see how, except for the hardliners who may feel that, I mean, they are not ready to, to, to uh, I mean, forgive whatever infraction. So, I mean, speaking hypothetical, I think that... These are your thoughts. Yeah. Listen. Interesting to hear them. Kwegu. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am not surprised at the reactions, the mixed and split reactions that we are having. It's been so for quite a long time. Uh, I recall when President Kufu met some members of the minority caucus at the castle forgotten exactly which year it was. Uh, there were people in the NDC leadership who complained publicly and said that Mr. Kufour had tricked the minority caucus reps into the castle for a meeting just for a photo opportunity and show that he is a true leader or a statesman. I recall the same when President Kufour decided to honor pre former, president, uh, former President Mills, then yeah. Vice President. There was split reaction across the political divide. There were those in the NDC who said, ah, this is an endorsement. Then there were those in the NDC who were very angry, very, very, very angry. And a lot of them contacted me, and we had bitter arguments over that. You know? So there's that thing that we've been doing to ourselves as a nation. There are many examples, but I'm not going to go through all of them. And my brother, Idu Asari, mentioned how uh, Nana allegedly treated Mr. Rawlings relative to the withdrawal of protocol 
Ketsis and uh, Mrs. Rawlings' trial and all those things. There are always such reactions. Uh, you know, we're growing. Otherwise, we would be recalling how Lima was treated by President Rawlings and his NDC, PNDC, NDC chaps till he died. He lost his diplomatic passport for years. You understand? We know all these things. Are we going to continue being arrested by these emotional charges as a nation? Can we? All of us are guilty of that. I, talking, have the same problems as growing up. So it's a difficulty that we've had as a nation. 20 years of uninterrupted democratic consolidation. Perhaps it's about time we start making amends. We cannot all think alike. We are not seeking the peace of the cemetery, the stability of the cemetery. That's not what we are seeking. This is a multi-party democracy. It comes with the rivalries and the competition and all the rest, and it's normal. But at the same time, I think there are certain things that we all have a common interest in, a certain humanity that binds us together, and we can try as much as possible to highlight, to enhance those positives. And I believe it is in that context that I saw the meeting between Akufuado and Jerry Rollins. First of all, Jerry Rollins was a former, is a former head of state, former president of this country, and a founder of the ruling party today. Nana Akufuado is the flag bearer of the main opposition party, the largest minority party in parliament as we speak. If the two of them meet, definitely it will raise eyebrows. People will discuss what it is. So you look for the content of what they said. I think that it was so clear to me that they were all committing themselves to some level of security, stability, and peace as we go through these crucial elections. Positive or negative? It's symbolic, but it's positive. I suppose the president not too long ago hinted that he would soon be interacting with leaders across the political divide. Now, if that happens, what is supposed to be our reaction? Negative or positive? Positive, it should be. It's symbolic, but it has its, its own value, that it makes rank and file, all those people around, see that at least we have a president who is prepared to sit with opposition members, uh, leaders, interact, and they'll be discussing what? Peace, stability, security, and integrity of elections. There are institutions to manage all those things, we all know. But these are also stakeholders. So in terms of it's the event, I think we should see it as positive, even if it's symbolic. But you see, because of the personalities involved, it had an added significance. <coughs> if you've known Rawlings for long and Nana Kufuado for long, and their relationship, the history of their relationship, then you find it also quite dramatic. Uh, we don't have time. I would have gone into details to give you examples of what, what each one has done to the other. <laughs> uh, 1993, listen to Jerry Rawlings. This is published in Ghana Drum, August 1993 election. Rollins was talking of loans that private companies had taken from state banks. And this is what he was saying. On loans, he said that the fact that some of these Ghanaian businessmen were defaulting meant that they did not put the monies in good use. The chairman, that's chairman of PNDC, said that the loans that were meant for agriculture-based industries ended up with hotels. Citing the Ringway Hotel, he said, and I quote, I understand that one MPP politician even says that he cannot repay the loan because his hotel was bombed, adding that all these loans were granted by the National Investment Bank, which was headed by New Patriotic Party sympathizer. He dealt with Kufo's Alpha Commerce, dealt with Apia Menka and all the rest in this same interview, Daily Graphic. Akufuado replied. He held a crowded press conference. I was present, and I will go to that. At the crowded press conference, by Nana Akufuado to refute what the president said. He also said allegation by President Mills, uh, President Rollins, that the hotel was developed by loans that were supposed to have been given under agriculture-based industries was totally false. Nanado said the hotel was built by the late president Edward Akufuado from his own private resources. 
He termed the statements by President Rawlings as an open declaration of war, particularly against some established Ghanaian businessmen. This is said, and I quote, Herat's the use of political power to transfer economic assets to a new business class sponsored by the NDC to which it will be Spain and lawyer. Indeed, subsequent to this, Vincent Assisi went on record and said, yes, the NDC was using political power to create a new class of businessmen who will be sympathetic to the revolution. Beyond this, there are many other things Rawlings did and said about Akufuado. Terrible things here. Yana try how Nanado packed the court, how Nanado was recruiting uh, decide, uh, his, uh, uh, manifesto pledge to build, uh, recruit more people into the police. If I read them here, you would run. Very distasteful, harsh things. This is Akufuado's letter also redrawing the courtesies from on, on Rollins, protocol courtesies. Victor Smith had written to Akufuado, and Akufuado was replying, of course. Under the obsessions of the cabinet, he wrote to redraw the courtesies. All these things are here. So they've, they've had their own peculiar relationship. Long standing. Nanado's role in the Alliance for Change that led the series of Kumipreku matches made him a real target for Rawlings and his immediate lieutenants, those militants around Rawlings. The son of Nakufado as a huge threat. Indeed, the National Reconciliation Commission, because Akufado was the Attorney General and piloted it through the parliament, if you recall. Mm -hmm. Akufuado again became a target for Rawlings and his loyalists, who saw the National Reconciliation Commission as a weapon to destroy AFIC and PNDC. An erroneous view, in my candid opinion. You remember they named the Neil Rawlings Commission. So all these things have happened before. The two of them have had a peculiarly very difficult and challenging relationship. And that adds to the significance of that this That adds meeting. to the significance. Breaking the ice. Who says that is negative? Who but, says but, that is not but, positive? But, but if you add this mm -hmm. to you know, some of the recent comments or the recent developments about President Rawlings, for instance, about his wife and the NDP. I thought, I thought we'll be dealing with that, and I wanted to do this. I, I don't see the interaction. No. I don't. The point I'm trying to make is that some, some persons don't necessarily look at those elements as interacting. They see them together and therefore begin to imagine what sort of political consequence this may have as we move into 2012. Well, uh, you've changed my, the drift of my submission, but I will, I will oblige you. you know? the, the point really is this. Uh, for me, it doesn't add much to, in terms of electoral chances for NPP. But it shows that Akufuado is a political, is a statesman, he's a, 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 a smart politician. He's ready to build peace. He's ready to build collaboration across the political divide. Rawlings, clearly, if he had ignored or rejected that uh, request, would have looked very bad in the public eye. Former head of state, founder of a ruling party, and indeed an international statesman, whether we like it or not. I've had to accept that with much difficulty, <laughs> okay, over the years. So, to be honest with you, it's a plus for those who were engaged in that exercise, and it is not a minus for the democratic consolidation exercise that this country is going through. Is it not a political expediency? Uh, political expediency when Kufuor met Mills. Political expediency when President Mahama intends to meet political opposition leaders. I mean, that's the point I am making. Are we entitled to allow cynicism to be, to inform our reactions to these things? I'm saying that we lose nothing as a nation if these things are, the, look, when Bush comes to Ghana, Obama comes to Ghana, and we see our leaders across the divide with them, we say, oh, that's good. And people think that it's rare. Is it, is, it, is, okay. it real? is it just a facade? No, just no, days no, pass, no, the whole thing no, comes back, no, tensions no, start no. mounting. You don't build a nation by a one <laughs> shot. It's never built that process. way. It's never done that way. It's, it's, an, it's not an event. It's a process. Mm -hmm. There are those who appreciate the essence of that and promote it. Mm -hmm. That's the point. You see, it's, it's, this is a, process, a very contradictory process. Mm -hmm. There are the negatives and positives. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of nation we are. And I'm saying that, that there's the need for those who can focus on the positives. 
highlight them, enhance them for whatever their minimal effect. The totality over a period builds a nation. But if cynicism should become the main thing and, and dismissive would dismiss all these things, I think we'll be much will be in, in a lesser position than will be uh, as a nation. That's, that's my feeling. Okay? Call it anything. Then I would advise the president to forget his uh, project of meeting political party leaders because it will be subjected to the same cynicism and it's not worth it. Okay? Mills went to the castle when Kofi Annan came to Ghana together with other political leaders. Read what he said. He said that was positive. When Ghana at 50 came, Rollins rejected the invitation. President Mills, then candidate Mills, went with leading members of the NDC. That thing helped the spirit of the nation. We knew our president, former president, was out. He issued a statement that was so terrible you couldn't even read. But his candidate, the part, candidate of his party, was there. joined up with leading members of the party and look at the atmosphere that happened at the Independence Square. It didn't bring food to the table, I agree. It didn't solve the energy crisis of Ghana, I agree. <laughs> But it has something spiritual about it. Yeah. And that is part of nation building. That's the point I'm making. Uh, Connie Dantuman says, indeed, Nana Kufuado has shown maturity in this political era. Alolo from the United Kingdom says, day in and day out, you preach for inter-party discussions and cohesion among party leaders and statements. President Mahama recently hinted that he will initiate an inter-party dialogue annually. And now Nana Kufuado takes a bold step to visit ex-president Rawlings, which is, his, which is a historic moment uh, in our politics. And the NDC turns around to call that hypocrisy by Nanado. Let's move from this mediocre way of doing politics. Uh, John from Winneba says the NDC should not be afraid. JJ knows what he's doing and where he belongs. Abbas Haruna says it baffles me so much when communicators of political parties can be peddling on truths against their opponents. I listened to Kwabna in your studio and he seems to have special documents which he only knows about. For once, why can't the MPP admit the fact that uh, insults and untruths can never help our country? For that matter, we as a nation and as a political party should learn to respect one another's views, regardless of our political color. We're in the final uh, dash of uh, this morning's program news file. Let me read a couple of um, messages I've received from some of the lawyers who are listening to us this morning. I'll start with Dr. Raymond Atuguba. He says, uh, my friend Ace is making many mistakes. The Statutory Instrument Act provides for four and not three pieces of subsidiary legislation. Oh, okay. The Constitution does not require instrument of an executive character to be laid before Parliament. Yes. It is not what the instrument is called that is determinative. It is what it does that determines whether or not it should go to Parliament. Nana Santibidi too also sends us a text. It says, CI 79 establishing the Judgment Debt Commission is dead on arrival. Article 278 of the Constitution requires that the President establishes the Commission of Enquiry by a constitutional instrument. Article 117 requires that instrument to be laid before Parliament for 21 days before it can have the force of law. The CI was gazetted on October 8. Parliament had risen. They will be back in November for about a week. Otherwise, they are gone until after elections. This means that the sole commissioner and his commission will not have legal backing to do any work uh, in this parliamentary term. The whole thing is a ruse to deceive the public into thinking that the president is doing something about judgment debts. In my opinion, it's laughable. Let's hear about your opinion as well. 1422 Across Networks, or put your thoughts on our Facebook wall. Um, E.T. Mensa in Wa says, when you preach probity, transparency, accountability, and honesty, and do not honor them, you will be wearing different ethical clothing like a wolf in sheep. The NDC should think. Uh, Subio from Wa as well says, whether President Rawlings is or is not NDC, we will surely win come December 7th. This one doesn't bear a name. It says, it is said that in politics there are permanent interests and no permanent friends. Another one that doesn't bear a name. Rawlings has outlived his gravitas. Mahama will get more than 95% in the voter region. Right. Karim Bana says, we voted the NDC in 2008 because of Rawlings. He came and campaigned in almost all the constituencies. So the NDC propaganda should give us a break. In the past week as well, Ghana has had reason to worry about what a UN expert panel claims is a military command structure that they have identified resident in Ghana seeking to topple the government in Ivory Coast. Ghana has consistently expressed uh, that it will not or she will not allow <coughs> her land to be used as a launch pad to destabilize Ivory Coast. 
But as this new expert report, which was laid before the UN Security Council yesterday, comes up, we're asking ourselves whether or not we are playing ostrich with this subject. How could this affect our relations, even security? And security is worrying because uh, the UN expert report suggests that mercenaries are being hired from Mali. And if you followed what happened in Libya after a lot of weapons were dumped in Libya to help the rebels, uh, there are reports that many of these weapons have been traced down into the northern part of West Africa. And so when inferences are made, uh, uh, you know, on the subject of mercenaries coming from Mali to support the exercise, especially at a time when we're going for elections, it makes us all worried. Are we playing ostrich with this? Ms. Adagrini, let me start with you. Well, the, I mean, the report doesn't say that the issue, I mean, the, the incident of the hiring of the mercenaries and the setting up of the command structure are done with the connivance of the authorities in Ghana. I understand it to be saying that there is such an arrangement perhaps on the territory of Ghana. But as whether the Ghanaian authorities are aware and one way or the other failing to take necessary steps to deal with it, I do not think the report... Indeed, our Foreign Affairs that. Minister has uh, responded that Ghana will be uh, also responding at the UN Security Council okay. because we have not even been informed of what they found. Exactly. And, and that is the problem. So that being the case, the issue of we playing ostrich may not really be an issue. Because you cannot be playing ostrich when you are genuinely unaware of a problem. It is when the problem is so glaring and you are ignoring it, that playing its effects or impact or importance that we can rightly say that you are playing ostrich. But be that as it is, and as rightly said, I think it is fair that experts who have reason to believe that a situation of this nature exists should have, at least in the very minimum, tried to find out from the Ghanaian authorities whether they are aware of such a situation or they are not aware. It is possible that some sections of the society can be aware and keeping it. If you recall, I think a couple of weeks ago, I mean, security agencies had to bust a group of people training in some parts of the country. And the reports, I mean, have it that some of them spoke foreign, I mean, uh, foreign uh, languages. Could that be part of it? I mean, we don't know yet because the investigations are still uh, ongoing. But Whatever the case is, we also have news items that suggest actions and measures that Ghanaian authorities have taken and are I mean, taken currently with respect to matters that have come to their knowledge regarding I mean, uh, possible destabilization issues at, uh, I mean, in Cote d'Ivoire. Currently, there is one of them who is fighting an extradition, I mean, a case against him. There were others too who were arrested, I mean, some months ago. So I think that it is a matter of such importance, even for our own internal uh, security. Well, if these are mercenaries, their only belief or religion is money. So anybody even internally can pay them money and then they can cause trouble. So it will not even be in the interest of Ghana to tolerate or ignore any such thing, if indeed it exists. But all said and done, it is a matter that the relevant authorities must uh, sit up and then uh, be up and doing to find <coughs> out what exactly the situations are. Mm. Yeah. And do you get that conviction when you hear the kind of uh, responses we are giving as a country and, uh, and, and, and assurances we are giving as a country? Our security agencies are speaking, our uh, foreign affairs ministry is speaking, our president has been speaking. Do you get that impression when you hear <coughs> all these comments? What I get, to be fair, is commitment or readiness not to tolerate such a thing and a readiness to do whatever can be done to solve the problem. But that would be different from actually being able to solve the problem. If in spite of these various forms of uh, expressions of commitment that we hear coming from various quarters, is anything <coughs> to do about In the light of this expert report, then we have reason to worry if in fact that is the case. And that will then border on how serious we are with measures that we take to deal with the particular situation. Mm. Mr. Dressari. Yeah, uh, mm. could you? I've been 
reading this report for a while and I think the impression that this whole report seeks to create, um, I think the reaction of the foreign minister uh, is appropriate and the manner in which he did it, you know, vehemently trying to put out the case that, look, this thing is not happening here. Moreover, uh, certain procedures that such reports have to go through before they are published were also not uh, taken into consideration. And if you read the report, uh, I think the third paragraph, I'll read a little part of it. It says, well, the report highlights one of such meetings that took place in Takrade on the 12th of July, where various exiled groups supporting Bagbo united their efforts and defined a course of action with a view of returning to power in Cote d'Ivoire. I think I'll end there. You know, if this, the report is based on things that happened as far back as July 12, we are in October, is the situation still the same? We've, we've had President Gbagbo visit Ghana during the death of the uh, late president. Uh, uh, president Watara visit Ghana. We've also had President uh, Mahama go to Cote d'Ivoire to thank him. And I'm sure the only, he only didn't just go there to say thank you. I'm sure some of these issues will certainly come up for discussion. Subsequently, we also heard that some uh, loyal uh, members of the or the erstwhile Gbagbo regime or minister, a minister has been arrested, uh, bailed and rearrested and all of that. So for me, as much as um, Ghana, we are in Ghana and we know that if such a thing is really in existence anywhere on this soil, certainly we will get wind of it. And I am a bit uh, worried that Cote d'Ivoire is the country we are dealing with very close, uh, a, a very close uh, pal, I would say. We, we, we share a lot of things in common. We have languages that we share in common, the people, the character and everything. And for me, I think these are very uh, trying times for Ghana. And I think our diplomatic, uh, the foreign ministry should, uh, the minister and his foreign, uh, and his team, and if possible, the president himself should delve deep into this matter and assure the people of Cote d'Ivoire that yes, if Ghana will, I don't even think any Ghanaian in his right senses will even harbor such an, such an idea, you know, to, 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 to do what? Because the, the, the situation on the ground will make it very difficult for anybody in Ghana to use the, 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 the soil here to launch any such attack. It's, it's, it, it can't be real, you know, but we have to forcefully also, uh, you know, debate this particular issue, and I don't know what I don't know what they base this report on. Whether they had people on the ground to to conduct any investigation in this matter, or they just sat somewhere in New York and picked up, uh, 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 you know, information from whichever sources to to because uh, if you checked when these borders were closed recently. The, the uh, reaction of the, uh, I think, the, the, their foreign minister and all of that, you could tell that there was something that, I don't know how to describe it, but you could, you could, you could feel some tension, okay? Whatever it is based on, one cannot tell, you know. But of course, knowing the Ghanaian nature, knowing how the Ghanaian operates, I don't think Ghanaians will do such a thing, especially for countries bordering us. Because at the end of the day, who is going to, this short time they, they, sh they shut the borders. Economic activities around the borders went, went so, so, so bad. People were, I mean, we had reports on your network. Some of your reporters were there, and, you know, that, that very terrible situation. And which, especially <laughs> months before an election is held, which government in their right senses, which responsible government will want to support such a cause? Uh, it really doesn't sit well. But of course, 
our leadership within the foreign sector, my foreign uh, ministry should really take this matter up <coughs> and, and clear this tension once and for all because it won't augur well for us, number one. Number two, um, uh, our, 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 we, we've come a long way, especially the support we give to Cote d'Ivoire even at the time when they had their challenges and all of that. Ghana stood right behind them and, and we, we did what was proper to make sure that uh, calm uh, returned to, to, to Cote d'Ivoire. And this is not the best way to, 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 be, uh, to, to be thanked, I would say. So we, we, we th I think the, our foreign minister, yes, he's, he's demonstrated the readiness to uh, go into this matter deeply so that at the end of the day, mm. we don't uh, continue to uh, have the tension I that... I hear you. If you are um, watching us on the Joy News channel on Multi TV, you are seeing live pictures from the Babaya Stadium in Kumasi uh, for the NDP's Congress. Uh, President Rawlings has just uh, arrived with uh, Nana Konedu Ajiman Rawlings at the rally grounds as they make their way up the staircase onto the main podium for the NDP's uh, inaugural Congress in Kumasi. Uh, you know, so we'll be showing a few pictures. Um, while we continue with our conversation, they are just mounting uh, the stage. Mr. Dwasa is not very excited at the pictures he's watching. Uh, Mr. Adagwene uh, is uh, watching without expression on his face. Kweku has a smile on his face. Um, and Kwabna as well has a smile on his face. I'm just giving a bit of commentary. Kwabna, while you are that, uh, maybe you want to tell us whether or not uh, we should do something else about how we're handling the oh, Ivorian dear. situation. Well, Kojo, the Ivorian situation to me is very serious. Okay? Ghana, we are bounded by three French-speaking countries. <coughs> and we seem to be the most peaceful among all these three countries. At least that's what people tell us. So when you sit down there and you get such a situation, it looks very bad. What would be the effect if another war breaks out in the Ivory Coast? A lot of these, uh, these uh, uh, refugees will come in here. And that's going to be a problem for us. Like my, uh, my friend uh, Adwasara said, when the border was closed, what happened? Economic activities ground to a halt. So this report must be taken very, very, very seriously. If we don't have the information, our foreign minister must write to the United Nations or those who issue the report for instances that they can cite. They cited one instance of a, a July meeting. Is that the only one who were at the July meeting? Can they point some of these things people to us so that we can deal with them? Because it is, if, if it goes on, it's going to destabilize this country. Already we have a problem with Africa's along the uh, Jubilee field area. And then they, they, get to, they get convinced that we are harboring mercenaries here to come and destabilize them. There's no way they will sit down with us to negotiate an a settlement on the Jubilee Field area. And that may even lead to another war. But one thing too that we, when you there's two money for now, two a craft for now, two a men so forth. Which means Which means when we are saying this thing is not good, we must also send a message to Watara. You see, you all went through a crisis at that time, even though some of us felt what Bagbo did was wrong. But if the United Nations is dealing with Bagbo alone, okay, then let's try and bring peace in the country. Let's extend an olive arm to everybody else. Come home. Let's even set up a committee or a re through the reconciliation committee. I think they mentioned they were going to do that at the See, point. come please Financial tell action. whatever you did and so that you know you get it out of your chest. And we all realize what we did this time was bad. And just like we said, somebody said, we remember the past to correct mistakes and not to collect grievances. So when we go through this and you tell me all the bad things that you did and I tell you all the bad things that we did, you all come to the conclusion, don't let us do these things again. When you do that and you still have people planning to overthrow you, then you have a case to deal with them. But once that has not been done, 
and you think there are people in, uh, in Ghana and Liberia trying to overthrow you, then you also shed your responsibility to the people of Ivory Coast. This is what I also want to send to Watari. <coughs> you must do something to let everybody who was involved in this thing feel that he or she is now welcome at home and there is a new form of government or a new system in Ivory Coast that is for all of us and not for every, uh, not for a, a, a small section of it. That, that is all I have to say. Gregor, I'll give you the final word uh, yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I shared the sentiments he's expressed on the latter part of his uh, point as to how Watara should go about re-engineering those things. But you see, it's something that intrigues me. The UN group of experts, mm -hmm. if you read the statement issued by the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Chris Pogo, it appears they requested and were granted opportunity to visit Ghana. They interacted with the Ghanaian authorities relative to the implementation of the sanctions thing. And so I find it a bit intriguing that in spite of that, they conclude a report without reference to us so that we could have reacted to some of the findings they've made. And yet this, and I'm not bothered about the leakage. I'm a journalist, so that's not my problem. But the intention to we submit intercept. it to the Security Council for debate or discussion or scrutiny mm -hmm. ahead of the, uh, in spite of the fact that we don't have an input. I find that worrying. Yeah. I think that's not fair. So we need to question the integrity that went into that kind of decision. You know, it's fair to question it. And Ghana being a very prominent member of the UN and noted for its peacekeeping and all those things, we cannot just sit idle and let this thing pass without any argument. That's one. But you see, uh, we shouldn't delude ourselves. There is a history in this sub-region where exiles and refugees have become sources of problems for the other countries. It happened to us. Eh? There were Ghanaian exiles in La Côte d'Ivoire and Pogo who occasionally had, did incursions here, this particular under the PNDC regime. Also during the Nkrumah regime and the Champon regime, these things did happen. There were Togolese refugees here who crossed the border to go and do uh, undertake destabilization against the Yadama uh, government when the PNDC was in charge here. There is that history. Look, look at Liberia and Sierra Leone, cross-border. So we have that potential in this part because we have refugees here, not ordinary ones, but political exiles, military exiles, you know, security professionals who are in exile, who are feeling insecure and uncomfortable with the things here. So it's a very difficult thing. There's a deep-rooted suspicion within the Ivorian government, a section of it, deep-rooted. That's why when some of them, our friends say, so what I see is, uh, Professor Mills is wise this. We said, fine, that's diplomatic talk. Beyond that is a sex section of the Ivorian government. And read the pro-Ivorian government media. You see those things consistently. Consistently, there are newspaper reports. Those papers are known to be very close to the Ivorian government, backed by top-level people. And they consistently write stories to the effect that we are plotting the, and with, with the Ghanaian collaboration against their government. Is there? This is a, a consistency that exists. We've got to do a little bit more than perhaps we are doing now in terms of our own security surveillance and checks here instead of monitoring the movements of the Ivorian refugees and all the rest. But I agree, bottom line is what happens within La Côte d'Ivoire itself. That is true in the long term sense of the situation you know so uh th this is how this is the way i see it you know? mm. it's uh just a uh, few minutes before we hit uh, midday i want to make uh, some final comments as we wrap up no this but morning. could you could you On just i'm sorry yes. that ci matter i'm inclined to support the point being made by bda to an ace i don't know law so i'm not challenging my brother here in terms of the law but I think that the earlier something is done about it, the better. A conclusive position should be put out there. Otherwise, as he said, this could be dead on arrival. Mm. Yes, I think we should sit up and look at it. 
I hear you. Like it, yeah. I hear you. Uh, some more thoughts coming through this morning. One more point about the Judgment Debt Commission. Those who say parliamentary involvement should, um, those who say parliamentary involvement should ask themselves a simple question: What is the instrument called? Why title an executive instrument as a constitutional instrument? The fact is that the only time the president can set up a commission of any kind is pursuant to a constitutional power. Any other body set up in like manner can only be a committee. A committee cannot have the powers of a high court. There's, uh, there is no two ways about that. A presidential commission can only be established pursuant to Article 5 and 278. The other commissions mentioned in the Constitution are established by Parliament. So contrary to what Dr. Atuguba says, the nomenclature matters. Okay, so a number of legal arguments there. I'm sure but sometime, lawyer, I'm sure. yes, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure if we give the lawyers the whole day, you know, they will end it here. I'm sure sometime during the coming week, we'll spend some, some more time on getting some legal clarity on it. Here are our final comments as we wrap up on news file this morning. We've been discussing three major things. Corruption, the Rawlings factor, and the Ivorian situation. On corruption, the practice where in our politics everybody accuses the other of being corrupt is in the long run inimical to everybody. At the end of the day, what the average Ghanaian takes home is that every politician is corrupt. So we must tighten the uh, avenues for investigating reports of corruption and fighting corruption. And we must do this in a manner that most importantly instills confidence in the average Ghanaian, regardless of his political leaning. Uh, with reference to the recent new charges against the NDC, only time will tell if the party will speak up and absolve itself from these challenges. Talking about the Rawlings factor, you know Mr. Rawlings has always been an unpredictable character in Ghana's politics. His recent maneuvers on the political landscape make interesting headlines. I'm sure that his meeting with Nanado has added to reducing the politics of entrenchment, but it remains to be seen if he will be a major factor in the 2012 elections. And on Ivory Coast, as has been said by my guests, let's not take things for granted. My name is Kojo.